When not at work, he enjoys cycling and spending time with his family. I'm sure you'll get a lot from his presentation, as Mark is a great source of knowledge and can offer a lot of help in not just product design and testing, but in many different aspects related to packaging. We also have joining with us Herb Schunemann, President and CEO of Westpac, and he'll be our panelist today. Before we get started, by a show of hands, how many of you have actually heard about the damage boundary method? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Applying Damage Boundary Principles to Save Product and Package Costs. The scope of this webinar is to expose you to damage boundary, explain some of the concepts, and illustrate how to use this information to save costs, particularly in the area of logistics. Elite, do we have any responses from your previous question? Um, I asked for the hands to be raised, and so far I only got 10% response that have heard about damage boundary, so please continue, Mark. Um, the floor is yours. Excellent. Uh, so what we'd like to do is just start uh, by talking about the damage boundary term in the value of the damage boundary, uh, which is what we determine, is where we determine the damage boundary of a product. Uh, and we get a lot of information from this simple method. We know where the product breaks, and we call that the product shock fragility. Uh, we're testing the product in response to shock input found in the distribution environment, and the product will have uh, other envir environmental sensitivities, so we want to be clear about our focus, that we're, we're focusing on the, the shock input uh, found in the distribution environment. We can then use that information to make better choices about packaging. We can also use that information to provide protection for the product, ultimately uh, designing a better package. Uh, if we use this method properly, the larger benefit will come in terms of uh, cost savings, in terms of logistics costs, and help us to meet some of our sustainability goals. Uh, one point I would like to clarify here is that sustainability can mean a lot of things, and I'd like to use sustainability, or the term sustainability, uh, for uh, meaning the overall reduction of, package, of packaging and the potential use of alternative materials. Um, the use of the damage boundary method will empower you to make these decisions. I'm sorry, Mark, we have a comment from our panelist, Herb. Yeah, Mark, I'd like to interject that, that uh, damage boundary or any shock test uh, procedure can be used uh, for a variety of different purposes, including distribution, but not exclusively for that. Uh, for example, you know, if you're trying to ruggedize a product uh, because of its uh, uh, in-use environment, but for example, uh, helmets or or uh, skateboards used by some very aggressive type of things of uh, people, uh, that kind of stuff. The, the method works for that as well. Um, the package or the product doesn't know whether it's in the distribution environment or wherever, so it just responds to shock. So it's a, it's a pretty universal concept. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Herb. And uh, like Herb said, this applies to all types of products, but in particular we're going to be interested in the manual handling of products, so that's going to limit uh, the, the discussion or the application of the damage boundary to things uh, probably in the neighborhood of 100 or 200 pounds where uh, manual handling, uh, lifting of the product uh, will uh, be a particular, uh, will subject the unit to shock. So knowing this, uh, we're going to uh, damage boundary is a product level test, and there are going to be trade-offs between product ruggedness and package protection. The most significant trade-off, of course, is going to be in terms of cost, and these costs are going to be related to the improvement of the product, so increasing the ruggedness of the product, or additional costs in terms of packaging. How much more packaging is going to be required if our product is uh, less rugged or uh, fragile. Either way, uh, this knowledge is a unique and significant attribute related to the product for the purposes of transportation and the in-use environment. And we must recognize that this will not be the same for any other product. Now I'd like to 
go over some of the history of, of damaged boundary because I think that's important to address that. And damaged boundary was uh, theorized not far from here in Monterey, California back in the, about the mid-1960s. Uh, prior to that time, the process of designing a package focused mostly on the materials and not on the product. This development cycle was empirical uh, where the results were determined more through trial and error rather than through an engineering methodology. The roots of damage boundary actually come from the shock response spectrum analysis that's used to analyze buildings related to earthquakes and seismic activity. Uh, Dr. Robert Newton, during his time at the, po the Naval Postgraduate School, was tasked with developing the test procedure that we now call damage boundary. This procedure was then adopted by ASTM and developed into the specification D3332. It's also become a part of the six-step method for developing a package system. And the significance of all this uh, was that the, it's the first step in making the package design or in making package design an engineering discipline. As other methods have come and gone, uh, the damage boundary method has maintained its presence primarily because of its simplicity and the results that we, get, we gain uh, yield a wealth of information about the product. And this can be used to make better decisions in terms of package design. Elite, are there any uh, questions at this time, uh, kind of covering the basics there? No questions at this time, Mark. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what, what's considered the genius of the damage boundary. Uh, this method is still studied and used because it simplifies the process of determining how fragile a product is and how much packaging will be required. A damage boundary does this by using two waveforms that are very easy to program using shock test equipment. These waveforms, when we use them together, excite the entire frequency range of the product. The essence of damage boundary is to determine the sensitivity of the product to a velocity shock and an acceleration shock. Velocity shock pulse has a short duration relative to the natural frequency of the product, where an acceleration shock pulse is characterized by a long duration. Using these waveforms together provides information about the product very quickly and the cost of conducting a damage boundary test is inexpensive relative to the entire product life cycle. Uh, and as I've mentioned before, the damage boundary theories withstood the test of time where other methods have uh, faded in popularity. So what does a damage boundary look like? Well, simply, it's the graph of peak acceleration versus peak velocity change. Now, velocity change is a is a rigid impact or high frequency rigid impact where acceleration is a lower frequency cushioned impact. So as we look at this graph here this would be a typical damage boundary graph, a graphical representation of that where we have critical velocity as we move along the x-axis. Now uh, the x-axis we'll see as velocity change in inches per second. When we find a failure, uh, so basically we would increase the velocity change, and as we find a failure, we would stop along this axis here. And this, become, this, would, this level here would become our critical velocity. This is now the boundary that we call the critical velocity of the product. Anything to the right of this level, the unit is going to be damaged. Similarly, as we go through the same process for critical acceleration, we move along the y-axis, along here, until we see a failure, which is represented by this line here. And we identify a level where we see failure as the critical acceleration. Anything that happens above this line 
where the unit fails is considered uh, the damage region relative to the acceleration of the product. Theoretically, any combination within the white areas would, be, would result in no damage to the unit. And I can uh, show some boundaries here as we move through this. So what do we mean by the critical velocity change of the, of the, uh, of the product? Well, these uh, critical velocity and, and critical velocity change and critical acceleration uh, may sound foreign, but they're around us and we experience them every day. When we refer to velocity shock, we mean the velocity content of the shock pulse or the velocity change. And this is difficult to con conceptualize. But what if we were able to relate it to something that we know, like drop height? Uh, we all know what happens when products fall, so that seems that uh, something that we can we can actually uh, calculate. So let's think of velocity change as the energy content of a free fall impact. Now technically we're talking about momentum rather than energy, but for the sake of today's discussion, let's talk about velocity change in terms of energy and what's required to dissipate that energy. Now let's look at the uh, equation for velocity change. Now we have the equation delta V is equal to 1 plus E times the square root of 2 GH. Okay, so if I, so what we have here is the coefficient of restitution. Uh, e represents the coefficient of restitution, which is the uh, rebound velocity, a ratio of the rebound velocity to the impact velocity. So if I were to drop a ball and it returns back to its initial point of release, that would mean that the rebound velocity is equal to the impact velocity, which would equal one. Similarly, if I dropped that ball and I got zero rebound, the ratio would be zero. So the coefficient of restitution has bounds of zero and one as a ratio. Now this ratio is influenced by the, the rigidity of the product and the impact surface, so it'll never be one and it won't always be zero either. However, we will be able to make some assumptions about E later on in our example. There's also G, which is the Earth's gravitational constant, and we're not used to seeing this in terms of inches per second squared, but it's, it's a constant. You know, we know what gravity is, and so it's 386.1 inches per second squared. And of course, we are going to measure the drop height in inches, or we're, we're actually going to calculate the drop height in inches. So um, we'll move uh, along, and we'll solve for an equivalent drop height for a given product. Let me give an example of um, a, a surface with a coefficient, uh, uh, impact coefficient of zero. Um, if you went and, and uh, jumped on, on your bed or, or something like that, you wouldn't expect to bounce back up as high as you jumped on it. So the, your, the, the springs and your cushions and things like that normally are, have a, a very low coefficient of restitution. Uh, and that applies to both your body and the bed because it's the impact surface that's important. Uh, a golf ball, for example, you, you whack that sucker. You want it to go as hard and fast as it can. So a golf ball is going to be designed with a... Uh, a coefficient restitution is near to one as you can possibly get it. You really want that sucker to take off. So that would be an example of uh, something, you know, if you drop the ball, golf ball into a rigid surface, it comes back almost to where you dropped it from. So those are the bounds that we're really talking about. So just a couple of examples there. Thank you. Thanks, Herb. So getting back to the uh, equivalent drop height uh, uh, solution, uh, we're going to make an assumption for a thin carpeted material that E is equal to 0 0.5. So that, so that uh, that's our, our coefficient of restitution. Uh, so the, we solve for H, and we get the following formula for the object in free fall. And from testing the product, now 
this is a part of the damage boundary. When we test the product, we find that our product passes at a critical velocity change of 150 inches per second. So using uh, that number from the experimental testing and g, uh, which is a gravitational, gravitational constant, we plug it into the equation and we find that our product can survive an impact from 13 inches onto a thin carpeted surface. Now, uh, what that tells us is that in, in most terms, our, our product is going to be uh, fairly fragile if it can only be impacted from 13 inches. So that the packaging is going to have to make up the entire rest of the, uh, uh, the packaging is going to have to make up any deficit in the distribution environment uh, typically associated with the, uh, the design drop pipe. Now let's move on to acceleration. Acceleration is the peak acceleration of where, uh, uh, which is a peak acceleration, which is a level above which the product will fail. Uh, this does not allow the critical uh, acceleration levels to reach the product. So this is where the package cushioning does its job. Um, okay. Uh, so I'd like to stop here. Do we have any uh, questions here, Elite? Um, actually, yes, we do have a question from the audience, Mark. Um, one question um, related to just damage boundary and what we do here at Westpac. Uh, audience member would like to know how long does it take to do a damage boundary test typically? Uh, to conduct a damage boundary test, it can be uh, completed in a relatively short time of about a day. We can uh, conduct uh, uh, both regions of the uh, damage boundary uh, uh, in about one day. Let me add that that uh, is highly dependent on the nature of the product. Um, that uh, some tests last for a week or more, and a lot of it has to do with really determining what is damage, as uh, we'll cover uh, a little bit further. So the time varies uh, depending on the nature of the product and and uh, and that type of thing. Uh, but it can be done relatively quickly if you have a, a simple product uh, that doesn't require a lot of time or uh, expense or things like that to actually check its functionality or fixture to the shock table, things like that. Well, or it could be relatively long. But uh, in general, um, no more than two or three days is, 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 is typical, but uh, it, it varies. So it's a difficult question to answer. Thank you, Herb. Okay. So uh, as we mentioned before, uh, we're going to, or we just mentioned, we would like to define some sort of acceptance criteria. Uh, now, first we need to establish this, uh, and we need to define it ahead of time uh, so that everyone is clear on what failure actually means. The easiest type of damage, of course, to identify is catastrophic failure. But more often, we need to address things such as cosmetic failure, uh, perhaps due to plastic bezels or uh, that, something of that nature, or a scuffed finish. It is usually not defined by the laboratory or the manufacturer or even the packaging distributor, but your final customer. So this can be defined as any condition not acceptable by your final customer, whether it's retail a retail customer or a business to business customer. Now here's a picture of a shock test machine. And uh, th as you can see, it's a fairly large piece of equipment. And uh, Elite wants to interrupt here a second. Um, 
I apologize, uh, Mark. It seems like we're experiencing some te te technical difficulties with the slides. Uh, we appreciate your patience while we wait for this to be resolved. And the analyst has something to say, Herb? Uh, yes, as a as piece of background information, the damage boundary theory was, uh, as Mark mentioned, initiated during the, uh, the actually it was the late 60s, and uh, actually had the pleasure of uh, sitting in on, actually not sitting in, about working in the laboratory at Michigan State University in the 1968, during the summer I was uh, employed there. And we were testing all kinds of stuff, uh, refrigerators and toasters and, and uh, TVs, a uh, variety of different things. Had, had little or no idea what was going on except that uh, I got to pick up the pieces that fell on the floor. Uh, as it turned out that, that that test procedure was the prove out of the damage boundary. And uh, what happened at that time was a, a, a number of products were donated to the uh, uh, multi-sponsored research organization at Michigan State under the uh, direction of uh, Dr. James Goff, uh, kind of a, uh, an icon in, in, the, in the business. He's uh, since passed away. Uh, but the result of that proved that the uh, damage boundary concept actually worked. And it was an effective and efficient means of determining product fragility. Um, and and uh, it, the results were published in a general technical report number 17. And that was the data and, and the justification used to form the ASTM standard that uh, Mark mentioned, ASTM D3332, published uh, first in the early 70s. And that's kind of the history where we where we've evolved from. Uh, the damage boundary, as uh, conducted today, has many of the same uh, characteristics. Uh, just actually changed very little. Uh, the shock test equipment that Mark mentioned, and hopefully we'll be seeing here shortly, um, hasn't changed very much either. Uh, the shock test equipment is uh, uh, r relatively simplified over what what previously existed. And it really helped me a lot to visit some old-time laboratories and see how this kind of testing was done previously. There was a laboratory, for example, in, uh, uh, that I visited in the Denver uh, area that had uh, what was referred to as a Barry Sandropper. And uh, this was a uh, device where the table of the shock machine actually dropped into a bed of sand in order to help uh, condition or what we call program the shock pulse. Uh, and any of you familiar with this, this kind of uh, testing know that that yeah, sounds a little crude. And it was every bit of that. Uh, but it was the best we had at the time. So it was kind of considered maybe the first generation. And uh, after that, things improved a lot. So the shock testing has come a long way since the uh, since its early foundings. Uh, uh, those of you familiar with the uh, military or aerospace testing know that they have a <laughs> kind of a swing arm tester that was also fairly crude and is still used in some cases. But the, the current testing equipment, much better, much better. Thank you, Herb. I just want to ask the audience, can you guys now see slide 13 uh, by a show of hands? If you are seeing the shock test machine picture, please raise your hands. I'll give you a moment to click on the feature again if you are seeing the slides. Again, this is page 13. Okay, we have so far two people raising their hands. Um, I see there's more people raising their hands. I think we're good to go, Mark, if you want to please continue. Okay. So the, uh, um, in the use of a shock test machine, we would mount the product directly to the top of the uh, surface of the shock test machine and it would impact the programmers as you can see uh, at the bottom of the machine. Now in the next picture we have the product fixtured onto the shock machine and what we would typically call the face down orientation. And now notice how the product is being uh, uh, held down or secured to the table so that it can impose an impact. Uh, this is going to become very important because fixturing can actually pre-stress the product. Uh, so when we mount or fixture a piece of equipment to a shock test machine, we have to be sure to, one, uh, mount it in a, 
in its orientation correctly. In addition, we have to take into account influences on the fixturing of the of the unit, where we may impose some some stresses on the unit. I'm sorry for interrupting, Mark. It seems like we're still having um, issues with the slides. People are still stuck on 13, and they can't see it. Um, apologize again for this convenience. Um, if you are seeing slide 14 come up again, please raise your hands. Um, and while we wait a moment, okay, it looks like people can now see slide 15. So go ahead, Mark, take it away. Okay, thank you, Lee. Uh, so I was uh, briefly covering the, the ability or the importance of fixturing the unit similarly to how we're going to package it. So basically we're going to need some foresight into how the product's going to be captured in the packaging. And we're going to want to mount it or fixture it in a similar fashion. And we need to be sure that we don't stress the product when we fixture it to the shock test machine uh, so that uh, we're imposing forces that may not be seen in the package. So this is kind of a tricky area and uh, typically the, the uh, test engineer will be the one uh, uh, helping to determine the uh, to not pre-stress the unit. <clears throat> so now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, conducting the test and the first leg if we if we remember correctly is determining the critical velocity change of the uh, of the unit. That becomes the first uh, portion of the damage boundary and we're going to do that by using a short duration half sign shock pulse. And we will conduct this in a single axis at a time, increasing the velocity change. So in, in, in terms of the critical velocity, we're going to be actually raising the table. Continue, uh, at, for every increase, we're going to be raising the table a little bit more. And we're going to repeat the impact. We're going to repeat impacting the unit uh, for that orientation until we see damage. Once we see damage, we will stop and we will note the level, the last level, uh, the previous level, as the critical velocity change of the unit. Now we'll conduct this in all the six flat orientations of the product. And why do we do this? Because that is where all the energy will be applied, is directly into the flat orientation. So therefore, the product will have the maximum response to that shock input. Uh, if we did it in a corner, the, the energy would actually be dissipated in three uh, directions along that corner surface. So uh, by doing it in the flat orientation, we're able to maximize the response of the unit. Similarly, after we've determined the critical velocity change, we will determine the critical acceleration. Before we go on. Sorry, Mark. Um, we have a question from David who said, could we please see slide 14 again because it's hard to visualize without um, seeing that. Certainly. Thank you, Elite. Uh, so uh, slide 14 shows the product fixtured to the shock test machine. Uh, backing up a little bit, it's in the face down orientation in this particular case and we have some uh, uh, some bars holding the unit down. In this particular case the, the orientation is anticipated or the, the package is anticipated to capture the entire front of the unit which would be typical for uh, something with a bezel on it uh, so that you're distributing the forces along the entire surface. Maybe I could jump in here and, and uh, uh, say a few things about fixturing. And uh, it, it's something that is uh, as much art as science. Um, military aerospace type testing normally demands a fixture as rigid as the table on which it is mounted. Um, and and uh, many people agree with that. Uh, as a practical matter, what we try to do is a compromise between the, the, the cost and the uh, uh, timing delays of a rigid fixture uh, and something that's more flexible and, and can be used in different orientations. So 
the, the, the fact is that fixturing winds up being a personal preference. It winds up being uh, something that is uh, adaptable for different situations. Uh, so it's, it's uh, again, as much art as science. What we're trying to show here is, is that uh, we're, we're trying to make this as rich as possible. We use, uh, we oftentimes will use uh, uh, wooden bars to hold the uh, products on, sh on the shock test machines uh, because they are, uh, they're very low frequency. In other words, they, the, uh, the shock load uh, imposed by the, the wood tends to be pretty benign. Uh, especially for uh, the light uh, hardwood that we normally use. Uh, rigid bars of uh, aluminum tend to be a little more, uh, they, they load the product a little bit more. But this is all stuff that you learn through experience and, and doing and things like that. But the whole area of fixturing is something that could be a, a webinar of its own. So think about this for the future. If you'd like us to, to address this kind of thing in the future, let us know. We'd be happy to do that. Okay, back to you, Mark. Thank you, Herb. Uh, so getting back to uh, determining the critical acceleration, which is the second uh, portion of conducting a damage boundary or uh, damage boundary method, is uh, we would use a long duration square wave shock pulse. Now, of course, mechanical systems can't really produce a, a perfect square wave, but it, it's close enough. And you might hear the term trapezoidal shock pulse as well. Uh, similarly, we would uh, fixture the product as anticipated. So we wouldn't change anything about how we're going to fixture it. We're fixture it in the same way as we did for the, uh, the critical velocity change test. And then we would impact the product similarly, and we would increase the acceleration. So what that means is in how we increase the acceleration is we would maintain the drop height of the table and increase the stiffness of what we call the cushion or the programmer. And we would repeat this until damage occurs. We would also conduct this in all six flat orientations, again, to get the maximum response of the unit to the shock input. So the uh, slide here shows a typical damage boundary graph. And it would show uh, that the, again, the damage region uh, this is the, the steps that would be taken of, uh, of the unit successfully passing the critical velocity change until it gets to a point where we see a failure, and that would be known as the critical velocity change of the unit. We'd step it back one level so that we know that, it, that the unit successfully passed that, the last known level. Coming along here, we would keep the velocity change the same and we would increase the acceleration until we saw a failure. And then back it off to the last successful test, and that would be the acceleration or the critical acceleration of the unit. I'd like to point out that the actual number that we use for either critical velocity or critical acceleration has changed slightly over the years. As Mark correctly pointed out, uh, the test procedure calls for increasing both of those levels until damage occurs. So one can ask, well, is, is the damage producing level my critical velocity or is it the previous non, last non-failure input, as one often calls it. And so this particular graph shows kind of in between, which was one of the, one of the options that was used uh, uh, in, in previous times when, it, when the damage boundary was first published, you used the failure level, so it was truly damage. And then they backed off to the nat last non-failure input, and folks consider that to be too conservative. So because the ASTM group is a consensus organization, the consensus of the group was split the difference, folks. Call it right in the middle. So that, that's why you see the critical velocity and critical acceleration line drawn between the last non-failure impact point and the failure level. It's kind of a compromise. Often happens in life, but there it is, big as life. Okay, back to you, Mark. Thanks, sir. Uh, so the, the result of the damage boundary is an understanding of how the product will break when impacting a rigid surface, and that's the critical velocity change portion of this. And it tells us whether the package needs a pro uh, whether the product needs a package. 
The acceleration portion of this graph is primarily used for package design and it tells us how much packaging or cushioning is required for the product. So what do we do with this data? Well, as I just mentioned, the use of the acceleration data uh, is the primary focus for package design. So what we can do is we can design a package using this data, or we, more typically we would redesign a package, and this would be a reduction in our, uh, uh, this is where logistics uh, uh, improvement would come, is in the redesign of the package. Or we can cost optimize the package, uh, looking at the components of the package and uh, making decisions based on the types of materials. We would, uh, but of course, not all of you are going to actually be designing packages. You, what you're going to typically do is probably give it to a, a package designer or a distributor who will have a package designer, and you'll submit this information to them, and they should come back to you with a, a good design. Uh, based on the acceleration data. Now the acceleration data will influence the cushion material selection and we'll see that later on in our case studies here. In addition, the uh, package will be designed for opti uh, to optimize the logistics and this information will identify areas uh, for cost savings, particularly in global distribution. You know, no longer are the days where, you know, the, the, uh, the product moves domestically uh, across the United States. It, it's global. Our distribution environment is now global. It, you know, a bulk of our items are now shipped from Asia and over to the West Coast, and then they need to go to distribution centers. So the uh, ability to optimize the package system or the package design for logistics, uh, the op opportunity for savings is huge when we look at that particular leg. In addition, we can actually eliminate overpackaging with this data, and uh, today it could even uh, point us towards things like a, a more renewable type of material or uh, even the compostable materials. So before I get into the case studies, Elite, are there any uh, questions that uh, we might be able to address? Yes, we do have a couple questions. We have one from Lam, and he asks, if we're limited in the amount of products available and only have one to test with, what test do you recommend we conduct? Critical acceleration or critical velocity? Um, and then the other one was uh, sort of similar from John, and he said how many units are required for the test. So um, do you need two separate tests or one test? If you can please elaborate. Certainly, and, and that's really the balance that's, uh, that uh, we come to when we, try, when we talk about damage boundaries, how many units are actually needed. If I were to conduct a true damage boundary curve, I would need a total of 12 units, six for the critical velocity change and six for the critical acceleration, because I would be testing uh, one unit for each orientation. Now. I know everybody probably just had a heart attack when I said 12 units because nobody's going to give you 12 units to, dis to destroy or to subject to this test, potentially destroy. Uh, so now what do we do? Uh, oftentimes you only have one unit, maybe two if, if, if things are really generous at your, at your company. Well, what we can do is we can make some assumptions, and now these assumptions really add to the conservatism that's in the damage boundary method. So uh, what can we make, uh, what, what can we determine about the critical velocity change? Well, we can look at, if you remember a few slides back, our drop height, okay? So what is the anticipated drop height in our distribution environment? And this could be uh, actual measurements or it could actually be uh, related to the test method that you're going to use to validate your package design, okay? So we can use that drop height and calculate the velocity change for that drop height very easily, very quickly. And we can assume that that would be our critical velocity change for the unit. So that leaves the other leg of our damage boundary curve to be the critical acceleration. So now using the uh, critical velocity change from our drop height, 
we plug that in, program that into the shock test machine, and now we can start at a low acceleration level. Let's call it 20 Gs. We can start at a 20 G level, and what we would do is we would test one unit in all six orientations. Now understand that we're going to have low cycle fatigue in that unit as we're impacting it six times because we're testing all six orientations at one level. Very different than I just described previously. Then we would increase that level and repeat that in all six orientations. So now as you can see, this unit starts to get pretty beat up. Okay? If we have two units, we can get to a level where we see some damage and then we can verify that damage by using the second unit. But you know, that would be a luxury in, in most tests that we conduct. So uh, we can do it with one unit, uh, we can do it with more units, and um, uh, what happens is that we're not going to have the true damage boundary of the, of the product itself, but we will have an estimation that will be pretty good. Uh, the other thing that we might be able to do is uh, over time, if we test a similar unit with a similar shape, or maybe a, a family of units, we might be able to glean some data there and uh, add to our, our data bank. And so then we start to build a database of, of damage bound. Thank you. We have one more question um, from Brad. And he says, of what type of product is, I'm sorry, for what type of product is the critical velocity change important? And for what types of products is the critical acceleration important? That's, an, that's a really good question, and, and the reason is is that we have to take a look at our product, okay, uh, the product type, and uh, damage boundary can be applied uh, uh, to any product, but really what we want to look at is whether the product's going to be handheld and what, or not necessarily handheld, but what environment our product's going to be used in. If our environment is going to be used in a very rugged environment, uh, you know, either a handheld, think of your cell phone, you know, your cell phone has to survive the bumps and bruises of, a, of your everyday life. It's going to fall off counters, top, tabletops, going to get kicked around a little bit, things like that. So the damage boundary isn't going to necessarily have a, a large uh, result or a significant result in terms of the type of packaging materials you're going to need. So if we're, we're uh, looking at the damage boundary to provide uh, to provide information about the type of packaging only, then for something that's going to where it's in use environment is going to be more rigorous than its distribution environment, it's not going to have much value. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't uh, uh, you shouldn't conduct a critical velocity change test on the product, because that's going to give you some valuable information, but you probably won't have to do the critical acceleration portion of it. What, what the critical velocity ch change is going to tell you is what is your uh, mode of failure for, for that particular unit. Um, so there's still some value in, in performing a part of the damage boundary on a, on a product that has a, a rigorous in-use environment. Uh, products that are uh, where their distribution environment is going to be more rigorous than their in-use environment is exactly where the full damage boundary method really shows its force. And uh, so again, the critical velocity change says, do you need a package? The critical acceleration test tells you, how much packaging do I need? And, and uh, so we would conduct both legs of the test on a particular product of, of that nature. Does that uh, cover it? Thank you, Mark. Please continue. Okay. So the first case study that I'd like to cover here is, is just a simple illustration, really, of, of what happens when we can uh, reduce the package size or, or reduce the packaging of our, uh, of our shipping container, or basically our shipping box. So let's start with a 15-inch uh, cubed box. And after testing our product, we find that we can remove about an inch of cushion out of each orientation of the, pro of the, of the shipping, shipping box. 
So what that gives us is about two inches in each dimension after our test. We've now reduced our, our shipping box by two inches in each dimension after the test. So we now have a 13 inch cube box. So uh, we're going to put these in a, a shipping container because uh, they're manufactured uh, in, over in Asia. And we're going to put all these into a container. And we're, we find that the, the, the box itself has reduced uh, the volume by 35%. And we can assume that the cost of shipping a container from Asia to, over to the U.S. is about $6,000. So as we can see, we've gone from uh, 1,400 units, over 1,400, almost 1,500 units before our cube reduction, and increased it to over 2,200 units. Now, you know, that, that's cube reduction. That's volume, okay? Uh, that's the... Uh, how many more units we can get, 50% oh, more units inside our container just based on the damage boundary data that we collected. Uh, so taking just the, the pure number of units and dividing it by uh, uh, $6,000, the original package design at 15 inches cubed was about $4 a unit to ship versus the uh, reduced package, which is a little over uh, $2.60 to, to ship. So now that's a savings of, of, you know, a significant savings of a buck 43 estimated on that. And that's just uh, from the, the single container going from Asia over to the, the West Coast. That doesn't take into account uh, the logistics uh, reduction of bringing it, shipping it to a distribution hub and having it uh, uh, shipped to drop sites or basically shipped to the end customer. So there's savings all along the logistics route uh, from the point of manufacture to the point of end use. Yes, sir. I should point out that, that uh, even though buck 43 doesn't sound like a lot of money, to some of us at least, that goes directly to the bottom line. This is packaging is an expense, and the expense reduction results in a profit improvement immediately. So every unit that your company ships uh, with that kind of a of a uh, cost saving results in a, in a savings directly to the bottom line. And boy, I tell you, that's something you can take right to the boss because that goes right to the top of the corporation. You can save a uh, you know, just by a, a relatively simple test like this, save a buck forty-three per unit. I don't care how much the darn thing costs. You're gonna get you're gonna get people's attention. So this is really significant stuff. It has a lot of value. And economics speaks for itself. So back to you, Mark. Uh, excuse me, Mark. Could you please go back to slide twenty-two? We had somebody that just wanted to take a look at that slide for a moment. So that's just regarding the saving cube versus package cost. So we'll give you a moment to just look at those numbers real fast before we move forward. Um, and I can actually ask you a question we have from John while we wait. Um, he'd like, when, sh when should you do this test, before or after package design and material selection? Regarding damage boundary. Yes, and that's, uh, that's a good point. The, uh, where we would like to see this, I mean, it's really a matter of where we would like to see it. We'd like to see it before the product is even designed because you can make product improvements, and uh, we're going to talk about that next in the next case study, but you can make product improvements uh, early on before the product gets into production. Now, that's not always possible, and we understand that, uh, but the earlier you can get into the product cycle, the better. And, and that's really the bottom line. Uh, do understand that you know, there are some other risks in terms of like uh, testing prototypes because they, they may not be as, uh, as strong as the, the original or the former uh, production unit. But uh, as early as possible in, in the production life or the product life cycle is when we would like to see it. Now, that doesn't always happen and, and we can still conduct it on a production unit later on 
but that's going to really handcuff us to uh, any product change, significant product changes. You know, we may be able to add a little uh, bracket here or, or tie something in there, uh, but we're really not going to be able to make uh, overall drastic changes to the product. I'd like to uh, jump in and, and point out that uh, one company that you all know very well, uh, it's a computer company with a, a, a fruit name, if that gives it away, I found out very early on that uh, uh, the, their particular product uh, designed, uh, uh, packaging designed without the use of this information resulted in a 40% DOA uh, did on arrival rate of the initial production of the product. Well, killed the product right there and it, it didn't do the company any good either. Um, so uh, Mark's point is a real good one. As early in the development cycle of the product as possible. And there, there are trade-offs between, you know, testing prototypes and, and that kind of stuff. But almost all, uh, especially high-volume products, are going to have several builds in the prototype stage. And if you can get your uh, get your 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 hand in there to, to to get some of those for this very useful and very practical uh, kind of test, you're, you're just money ahead. And money speaks, even though someone says, "Oh, you're going to get, you know, we're going to destroy these." Forget it. Well, money speaks, and, that, and, and what you're trying to do is optimize the, the, the design as early as possible, and that results in, in cost savings, and there's no reason not to do it. So earlier, the better. So back to you, Mark. All right, thank you. Uh, the next case study I'd like to do is, is talks a little bit about product recognition. And, uh, you know, uh, we do a lot of testing for medical device manufacturers, uh, but usually what what's on the end of the medical device is really uh, a, what they call capital equipment. And in, in this case, we can just assume that it's an RF generator, a benchtop model that may uh, apply a unit dose of radiation for a certain procedure or what have you. But uh, let's say we take this uh, RF generator and we test it, and it has a very, uh, what we'll consider a low product fragility of 40 Gs. Uh, that means the package has to be designed to protect against a Product cannot transmit more than 40 Gs to the product. So if, if it's a fragile product, it, inherently it needs a larger package because it needs to dissipate that energy to the product. So you're going to need more deflection, you're going to need more package, uh, more uh, room around the product to allow for that deflection, and it's going to limit the number of cushioning materials because there aren't that many materials that are uh, inexpensive relatively inexpensive to protect the product like this. And it's going to be costly in terms of volume. Remember, we're talking about logistics volume and reducing the uh, packaging, uh, the size of the packaging. So if we go forward with uh, perhaps improving the product, now what that means is we've identified a failure mode. And maybe that failure mode is simple to fix. It could be as simple as restraining a printed circuit board inside the unit could be uh, as simple as adding a bracket, something that doesn't cost a whole lot to improve the product. And we're able to do that and increase the fragility, or basically what we're talking about is increase the ruggedness of the product to 60 Gs. Well, uh, what that does is just by that little, uh, little bit of uh, improvement, our cushioning material selection has increased. We can look at other alternative materials. Uh, maybe they're polymer-based, uh, but uh, it could even be a corrugated-based material. It could be uh, uh, some sort of molded pulp or something like that. So basically, it's expanded our selection of cushion materials. It's not going to need as much material. It's not going to need the amount of deflection when it was in its fragile state. And of course, that's going to just transmit or translate right to reducing the package cube and reducing logistics costs. So that's the uh, the idea behind uh, a product ruggedization movement, uh, um, much like uh, Herb was illustrating with the uh, other example, uh, where they they didn't have a, they had a fragile product, and ultimately they went forward and improved the product. Uh, so uh, improve the product.
No, Mark, there's no questions regarding the case study. You can please continue. So really, uh, I'd just like to uh, conclude the webinar here with uh, just kind of a, a wrap-up of what we covered. Uh, you know, we covered a lot of information today, and uh, we talked a little bit about what the damage boundary is, uh, the components of the damage boundary uh, resulting in the critical velocity uh, change for the product and the critical acceleration of the product, and what those two uh, terms mean. Uh, for the success of the, of the product itself. We talked about uh, shock being the primary uh, component uh, in, in, for our discussion, uh, typically in the manual handling environment, and what we can do to improve this. We also covered uh, reduction of uh, the size of the packaging in terms of logistics, and uh, we also talked about product improvement, and that also uh, translated into reducing the package size and, and improving our logistics. And uh, we talked in terms of sustainability as well. Uh, sustainability uh, we defined earlier as uh, the reduction of packaging and the uh, reduction of, of packaging materials. So I hope that uh, you got uh, some, a lot of value out of the, uh, the webinar here. Uh, I appreciate you spending an, about an hour with us. Uh, Looks like Herb wanted to add something. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I also want to point out that it doesn't have to be an electronic product or a medical product, uh, almost any kind of product. Anything that's shipped is a good candidate for the use of this kind of, of uh, analysis. Uh, early in my career, I worked for a certain company that made a lot of bleach. And uh, we were able to use uh, basically the velocity change, critical velocity change test, to design a better bleach bottle. and uh, the it, uh, it saved the company uh, a lot of money uh, early on in the, in the process. So it, uh, it doesn't take electronics or, or any kind of expensive stuff to use this, this technology efficiently, effectively, and to good use. Anytime that, uh, that you have something that's subjected to, to you know, dynamic input, shock input, which happens a lot during distribution, but also in the in-use environment as well, as Mark pointed out. Uh, it, it, there's, a, there's a good use for this kind of technology, this kind of study, this kind of analysis. Okay, back to you, Mark. Great, thank you. And then one thing I'd like to leave you with as well is that this is an engineering method that we can use uh, to, to uh, design or to identify and design the, the package for, for our product and use it to optimize the packaging in, our, in today's global distribution environment. So thank you for, uh, for attending Applying Damage Boundary Principles to Save Product and Package Costs. And uh, if there's any final questions, I'd like to turn it over to... Yes, Mark, we actually do have a couple questions. One comes from John, and he'd like to know, for new product introduction, the product is not available until it's ready to launch. And for package design, the package engineer is given a prototype slash SLA model. What do you recommend in this case? Uh, I would recommend that uh, you try to uh, get together with the product group or try to uh, kind of uh, get together with the product group and tell them what the importance of this is or uh, even have a even come down and, and have a discussion with us about the importance of this and try to uh, get into the the product development group the, you know, this is a something that we hear about all the time, and oftentimes the the product development is going on the same time as the package development. And what what needs to be done is we need to have a little bit of an offset there to try to to improve some things. Uh, Herb has another comment. Yeah, let me jump in here too. Uh, a lot of products designed nowadays on electronic media. You can take that uh, those designs and subject them to uh, software analysis such as uh, finite element analysis, and you can in fact get a, a reasonably good estimate of the fragility of a product based on the, the materials and their and the designs in in the uh, uh, in that uh, early prototype stage. It's it's a really tough position that you describe. I've been there, done that. And it's it's not easy or simple, but you've got to get a package. You can't you can't just uh, you know, wait till someone throws the product over the fence and say, "Here, ship it, Fred." 
uh, you got you got to be prepared for it. So anything that you can get your hands on is really the the answer to your question. Uh, people who have done this before might have a you know a suggestion or two. Certainly we do, as as Mark mentioned. Um, I, but I've actually seen it done with uh, some finite element analysis that was uh, reasonably good. It surprised me about how good it actually could be done with just prototype information. So that's one suggestion. Um, it may or may not help you. Uh, you may or may not have uh, access to finite element analysis software. But uh, give it a try. Give it a shot. You know, when your back's against the wall, you better do something. That can. So back to you, Mark. Actually, we have one last question from Connie, and she'd like to know, Many plant packaging protocols get the package to survive 50 Gs, and there's really no product fragility data to that. Do you know where that magical number 50 Gs came from? That's something that we encounter all the time, and, and it's often written in specifications. Uh, and it, it usually comes from some uh, archaic uh, product back in the, you know, back when uh, the product first de was developed, or maybe it's even something that somebody carried over, a product engineer carried over, and they just wrote it in the spec. Uh, the idea that uh, all products will survive or must survive 50 Gs uh, really uh, handcuffs you into a, a single number, and that may or may not be correct. Uh, you know, that may not be the, the number uh, that the product can survive, and if that's the case, you're really leaving money on the table if your product is more rugged. You know, as we illustrated, or I hope I illustrated today, is that's leaving money on the table in terms of your logistics costs and all that to say that it needs to meet 50 Gs. What a, what a good specification should say is to conduct a damage boundary on the product, determine what those levels are, and design accordingly. Uh, so I hope that answers the, the question a little bit. Another uh, a brief message here is that uh, I remember when, when the when the Bay Area Rapid Transit in the San Francisco area of March was being installed, and, and there was a controller that uh, that was being uh, being shipped for this, and and the controller designer was nervous about the thing, and he said, you know, this thing is really fragile, and I, the, the uh, engineer required, well, how fragile? And he says, well, two Gs. <laughs> and the designer, the, the engineer said, well. Well, I guess you better not turn it upside down because it's got one G this direction and one G that direction, and it's going to break. Uh, the The point is that, that people simply don't understand acceleration in many cases, and and uh, and those people who are subjected to a number like 50 Gs, it sounds okay. Uh, two problems: one is well, the one Mark pointed out. Maybe it's you know, maybe it's 80 Gs, uh, and that's not unusual even for relatively fragile looking stuff. And in which case, you're going to overdesign the package. You're going to leave money on the table. It's going to be costly to ship. You know all those. Kind of problems, but there's another problem too. What if the real fragility is 25 Gs? And that means that uh, you're, you're going to ship the darn thing. You're going to have the horrendous damage and shipment issues. So to uh, to take a number, a blind number like that, and and to simply uh, be a, have it imposed upon you uh, is is a is a really kind of a formula for disaster uh, of of one sort or another. Uh, wasted money, damage and shipment, or both. So it's a difficult, difficult position. If it's imposed on you and you can't do anything else, fine. You know, just salute and say yes. I'll paint, I'll paint your 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 you know your boat brown, sir. Uh, but uh, I I would uh, in, if I was in that that position, I would uh, do as much as I possibly could to determine the fragility of the product. You just uh, even if you get uh, uh, just one product and and you're able to do that, you'd be amazed at the amount of uh, uh, the positive changes you can make, either reduced damage in shipment or reduced uh, material costs. Okay, back to you, Lee. Thank you very much. It looks like we're out of time. Thank you for your presentation, Mark. That was great. And thank you, Herb, for joining us as well. Your feedback has been very, very valuable. Uh, now, if you missed anything or would like to listen to this webinar again, please check Westpac's website at www.westpac.com, and the presentation should be up in the next few days. Please check our website under Upcoming Events for our next webinar. And if there are any other webinars you'd like to see Westpac offer, please submit them as questions. Please also fill out the survey we'll be sending out via email, as we're always looking to improve our process. And also, if we didn't get to your questions or you need any additional information regarding this presentation, you can email Mark directly at mark at westpac.com.
Thank you all for joining us again. I'm Elite Jabrava, and have a great day, everybody.